right. Good morning, everyone. Um, or I'm sorry, good afternoon for those of you who are, who are Central and Eastern time. It's still morning out here in the Pacific. Uh, this is Una Daly, the Community College Outreach Director at the Open Courseware Consortium. And welcome to our first webinar of the Winter Spring Series. And uh, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers here today to tell you about uh, open textbook publishing and adoption. And um, we really hope that you can take this information back to your campuses and um, help your faculty to select high quality materials and um, help save your students money in the process. And just that, well, I'm sorry about that. We're just clicking a little bit slow here today. Um, I wanted to just go through briefly, for those of you who might be new to the Blackboard Collaborate system that we use here in the California Community College system, um, the chat window and the participants are on your left-hand side of the screen. Please feel free to use that chat window uh, throughout the webinar. Um, to ask questions and so forth. Um, we will hold the audio part of the questions until the end, but we will try to answer uh, the chat uh, questions as they come up and please use it for comments and, and to cheer on our presenters. Um, if you have any issues uh, during the webinar, um, do feel free to contact the tech support people at one seven six zero seven four four. 1150, and that's extension 1537 or 1554. And I'll repeat the number one more time. That was 1760-744-1150. All right. At this time, it's my pleasure to uh, give you a quick introduction to our speakers today. Now, once again, I'm Una Daly uh, from the Open Courseware Consortium, and um, our first speaker is Surreal Overlander. He is the Director of Library Services at SUNY Geneseo, Geneseo. and uh, Cyril, tell us a little bit about your job there. Well, um, hello everyone. My name is Surreal, and at Geneseo I'm the Library Director, which means um, an incredible amount of uh, appreciation for some of the finest library staff and librarians working with great students and faculty here and across the world. Thank you very much, Sorrell, and thank you for being here today to talk about uh, uh, in a few minutes about uh, SUNY. Um, one thing I, I neglected to uh, say is um, for those of you who are listening in today, um, welcome and please introduce yourself in the chat window and let us know uh, what institution you're with or organization. Uh, next up is um, David Harris who is the Editor-in-Chief of OpenStax College. And David, tell us a little bit about your day job. Uh, good morning, Uta and everyone. Uh, my day job is uh, pretty busy at the moment. I work with uh, OpenStax College and I work with our content development teams, uh, our partner teams, and the community uh, to develop uh, open education resources uh, for our project. All right. Thank you for being with us today, David. And our third speaker is uh, Dr. David Ernst, who is the Chief Information Officer at Co the College of Education at the University of Minnesota. And David is actually at a conference in New Orleans, I believe, today. So David, tell us a, a little bit about what you do back at the University of Minnesota. Yeah, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Yes, I'm the Chief Information Officer in one of the colleges at the University of Minnesota, the College of Education. And, uh, and I'm responsible for all the IT services there, but I spend the vast majority of my time working on educational technology issues. And, uh, and I'm also the Executive Director of their Open Textbook Initiative at the University of Minnesota, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Great. Thank you, Thank you David, for joining us today. So I want to invite you to show us where you are on this globe here. Um, and and uh, the way you can do that is by picking up um, one of the little uh, star, one of the little tools that are next to the star here and dropping that on your location on the globe. Um, 
I hope I explained that correctly. The star is in the little vertical toolbar in the middle. Okay, we, <laughs> thank you. We've got a smiley face over there on the west coast. We've got some east coast folks. Oh, ooh, boy, lovely. Uh, looks like we've got some folks in Florida. We've got some folks up in uh, the northwest. Up in, we've got some folks up in Canada, I'm guessing from Vancouver. Um, All right, wonderful. Anyone in the center? It looks like we might even have some folks here in the center down in Texas. Well, lovely. It looks like we've got a pretty good um, <laughs> overview of, of North America. And it doesn't look like we have any global folks today, no, no folks from overseas. Um, but maybe they'll, maybe they'll watch our, uh, our YouTube arch archive of this. We'll be archiving this, and it should be available in about a week. All right, before we get to the uh, seat of the show today, a ah. <laughs> little clicker is a little slow today. Um, here is our agenda. I'm going to give you a brief introduction, and then we'll hear uh, from Cyril first about the Open, Open Textbook SUNY initiative. Um, and next we'll hear from OpenStax, and finally we'll hear from um, David on the Open Text Library at the University of Minnesota. And as I mentioned, we'll hold our Q&A, at least our audio Q&A, until the end. So for those of you who might be new to the Community College Consortium for OER, we are the community colleges at the OpenCourseWare Consortium. And our mission is promoting the adoption of OER to enhance teaching and learning. And um, so our strategies are supporting professional development for faculty and staff and administrators uh, so that uh, they can select high quality materials and help expand access to education. And our focus remains at the community college, although uh, two of our speakers today are actually from the four year colleges and universities. And of course many of our students move on into those. And um, there's a lot of overlap between our goals. Uh, the Community College Consortium continues to grow. We have over 240 colleges now who participate in our consortium. And we're, I think we're actually in 16 states and provinces now. So I need to update that slide. So finally, getting to, uh, getting to the content for today, I don't think uh, any of this is a surprise to you. Textbook prices have been rising in the last decade, actually 82 percent um, since 2002, um, at two to three times the inflation rate. Um, and the average student spends somewhere over $1,000 textbook supplies. So this has become a really, um, a really significant issue for our students, particularly our students at the community college who really are less able to afford um, education. And um, research, I'm going to tell you a little bit about research that was done in Florida uh, just a couple years ago, which showed um, that 60% of students do not purchase textbooks, at least at some point, due to cost. And those of you who have been paying attention to the news over the last couple weeks, there was a recent report that reported that 60% of students often don't purchase textbooks uh, currently due to cost. And we know that this is a decision that we don't want students to have to make. Um, we know that it, it can impact um, and not only their success in the course. As you can see here, 35 percent of students take fewer courses due to textbook costs. So we know that it's increasing their time to graduation as well. And so um, the folks that we're going to have talking with you today are going to tell us about some alternatives that uh, your faculty uh, or yourself if you're teaching can use in your classroom to help students um, be able to afford education um, more easily. And now I'd like to turn this over to Cyril Oberlander, the Director of Library Services at uh, SUNY Geneseo. And um, he's going to tell us all about the Open SUNY Textbook Project. Thank you, Una. And um, thank you all for wanting to listen to this because I think we all see that there's a great benefit to reducing the um, cost of textbooks and really the cost of education. The SUNY Open, Open SUNY Textbook Initiative is really an effort to think about saving the cost not only at the 64 campuses across New York, 
but in a larger picture, making an effort globally to make our textbooks useful, learning resources useful across the world. Um, it's library-led, and it's from a, an innovative instruction technology grant that we got. But let's start with the problem, and you've already seen some of it, that we were trying to address. We looked at Open SUNY textbooks as a severe cost to students, or the textbooks, because they were charging $1,200 roughly a year. More importantly, we also saw that yeah, there was a big business in textbooks. It's roughly $6.5 billion in 2003. Worse, as a Florida student textbook survey, which was fantastic, it surveyed 22,000 students, it found that students didn't buy a lot of textbooks. The majority would, would take that um, strategy. A lot of times we focus on the idea that we're trying to get faculty to adopt open textbooks, but one of the major concerns that faculty are legitimately concerned about is that their students might not be adopting their expensive textbooks. And so I think of this as an opportunity cost. I'd like to add one more graph, which is really the student debt has reached about $1 trillion and is a severe problem that we have to deal with. But how do we do it? Well, libraries are interested in this problem specifically because not only do we want to help learning, we are also paying money for, uh, for the cost of textbooks as well. We run course reserves, which take staffing, which sometimes we're buying textbooks, and we're dealing with overdue fines, disputes, we're borrowing them, textbooks from other libraries, which cost money, especially because students keep them for the whole semester and we get lots of problems with overdues. There's a perception of a problem here. The parents and students are starting to perceive libraries and higher education as a problem, at the cost of it. So we saw it as an opportunity to really create a win-win. We have an opportunity to curate a win-win solution by thinking of it as not just textbooks, but thinking of it as a larger picture. These are learning assets. These are a way to engage the teachers and learners. And we think we have a role as curators of the learning environment or of content. So we thought of it as an opportunity to create the win-win. Our students recognize this problem as well. Recently, the students and, and for all of SUNY uh, put in a proposal to SUNY saying, we'd really like you to address the textbook affordability problems, create some solutions. And in that, they made a resolution that recognized our efforts in open SUNY textbooks. Students want answers and systems like the State University of New York, which has 467,000 students, are trying to find good answers to their questions. It's not just students who are looking for answers or who want to change things. This is an article, of, an excerpt out of an article that Jill Moxley wrote recently about open textbooks in academe. In it, he talks that publishers have an enormous amount of money that they've made based on his content. But what gives him the most control over his content and the greatest impact in the lives of students and readers is to make it, is to release it under a Creative Commons license. In fact, our own faculty member who wrote a um, book, Literature of the Humanities and Humanity, Dr. Theodore Steinberg, said that his profession in English has done a, a um, has served a role of not making books accessible as they need to be. Okay, yeah. So in his effort, and he wrote a wonderful humanities literature book, um, he's basically contributing, making it available to everyone because he feels that that's one of his roles as a professor, making a big difference with his students and everyone else who wants to, to read literature. So if you haven't taken a look, I encourage you to take a look at this one. What we're really saying is we know there was a problem and we know we needed to solve it. So how do we do it? In July 2012, we as five libraries were granted an innovative instruction technology grant from SUNY, $20,000, to do a call for authors. 
we essentially offered on November, tw uh, November 2012 $3,000 for authors to contribute a manuscript proposal. And if we selected it, they'd be given the, the incentive upon completion. We also paid for peer review and other services. In two weeks, we got 38 proposals. They were so good, we were very reluctant to just say yes to four. Um, so the libraries, many of them pitched in additional funds. We actually contributed $40,000 to produce 15 textbooks. We're already starting to produce them. We have three up now, and we're going to have two more up this month. And we're looking forward to making a difference in the year. This year, it's 15 textbooks. Now, you can see from here that libraries are managing the whole editorial workflow. Essentially, they receive the manuscript proposals, they, they review them, they select them, they do peer review, they send it out for peer review, they get all the information back. The librarians are also doing the copy editing. We have volunteers not only at participating libraries, but other CUNY libraries wanted to help, and they're supporting us with copy editing. Now, in addition to that, we do the text layout, and then in the final proof, we do proofreading. We do hire freelance on occasion because we don't always have the resources to go through all those 15 books. Now, what do we accomplish? Well, we're putting all of our uh, open textbooks as PDFs and EPUBs in Open Monograph Press. That's a open source software that was developed by the Public Knowledge Project. Uh, you see the URL here for our catalog of free ebooks. Please go ahead and, and take a look if you want. We catalog them in OCLC WorldCat. And thanks to David's help, we got them in Minnesota's Open Textbook Catalog, and we'll get them in below. What we're doing also is we're offering the authors a print-on-demand option. So we help them put it in Amazon for print-on-demand sales. It's an added incentive for faculty, SUNY faculty to offer these kinds of textbooks and make them open, free available online, but uh, also available in print because many people want them print as well. Now, what else did we do? Well, we, can, we add in every book a peer reviewers public review. The person who did the peer review for this textbook also wrote a public review that is embedded in each book. So anybody can read um, you know, a little statement by the peer reviewer about what's the strength of this book, who's the target audience, and, and what would be its benefit. This is an attempt to really help those who are evaluating open textbooks why should I read this, or why should I sign up for a class, or why should I evaluate this as a curricular resource? It's important to really include the peer reviewer statements, and that's what we decided to do in the book. We decided not to stop there. Um, Fifteen books in, in one year, in one and a half years, is, is pretty um, ambitious. But we got a second grant, thanks to SUNY, and we got a $60,000 grant to run another call for authors and increase the type of publications and the participating libraries. One thing to mention is now it's eight participating libraries, but we're also having support from other SUNY libraries along the city of campuses. We also have SUNY Press who's working with us in consultation. It's really a great benefit to collaborate with a university press like SUNY Press. This second pilot just finished its initial call for authors. We did a call for authors that had a, a deadline of January 31st, and we received 46 proposals, seven of which came from community colleges, and we are going to fund 16 of them. This year, we're trying a different selection review process that is a way of thinking about adoption that I think is really important. What we're doing is we've, we have a blind abstract with some of the details of the textbook that we're sending out to different faculty in the corresponding disciplines across the 64 campuses, or as many campuses as we can reach. We'd like the faculty in the same um, 
the, the same course, teaching the same courses that the textbook is designed for, to evaluate it on how likely would you actually select this textbook if it were published, what are its strengths, what courses might this textbook be useful, what are very important features you really want to see in this textbook. The last question is really an interesting one. Would you be willing to serve as a peer reviewer? The important thing here is that we want librarians and the teaching faculty to be discussing these at, uh, proposals because it's a way of doing a market analysis and communicate or discuss what's the nature of open educational resources today, what's the interest level on the faculty across SUNY, and how do we really target the best textbooks, open textbooks, for the market which are the teaching faculty so that they might really assign these textbooks. We'll compile all the scores so that we'll have some idea of what community colleges want, idea of what comprehensive colleges want, and doctoral uh, universities. In a sense, it's a selection review advisory board that's distributed across our 34,000 faculty and librarians. Now, this is the overall map that kind of gives you an impression of the next pilot. Essentially, we do the author's proposals, we do a selection of uh, review, we approve. The next phase is author writing. We do enhance the author's, um, we provide authors librarians support, instructional designers, templates, and we, we're there to help the authors deliver a high quality product. The peer review, we'll be doing two peer reviews per textbook at least, and there's an author revision phase, a copy editing, an author revision last, and a textbook approval. In the end, what we're really delivering on is in, by September 1st, 2015, roughly 31 high quality open textbooks. I suspect we'll be doing more because as last year, libraries tend to really want to produce and help their faculty publish these books because they know it makes a big difference. Overall, long term, this is an important point about our program, is that we're really seeking not just to publish open textbooks. We're really looking at how textbooks are really learning objects or digital assets that we want to be able to integrate in the courses, in the teaching faculties, LMSs, or other tools, and really give the students the tools to look at the quizzes, work with them, and also work with the faculty. Textbooks are one dimension of the learning environment. What we're really trying to build is a more robust one that the academy can really appreciate and works well for students, faculty, and libraries. This is a lot to take in at the last slide, but if there's any questions, we'll save them till the end, but it's a way of saying uh, the SUNY Open Textbook Initiative is more of a, an exploration about how do libraries and faculty and students work together to make a very rich and affordable learning environment that could be shared globally. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Surreal, um, and I, I think uh, that's a real inspiration uh, to uh, other systems that would like to uh, foster this kind of creativity among their faculty uh, in order to expand access to education for their students. So really, really exciting, and thank you so much for sharing that. All right, next up is um, David Harris, who is the Editor-in-Chief of OpenStax College, which has been producing some high-quality textbooks now for um, close to two years, almost two years now. And um, David is not only going to tell us about uh, some of their current work that they're developing, but he's also going to tell us about adoptions of um, the open textbooks that they have already released. And I think. Um, we're all going to be very excited to hear about how well Great. they're thank, doing. Thank you so and much, uh, Una, for uh, having me uh, chat with the audience today. And good morning to everyone. And I would like to really congratulate Surreal on the amazing work that they're doing at, um, at SUNY. 
In fact, we see incredible innovation coming out from many libraries. Uh, they are really driving OER. So what I thought I'd quickly do today is give you an overview of uh, how technology and OER are really a perfect combination together. And then talk a little bit about what we're doing with OpenStax College, OER licensing, uh, et cetera. And then, of course, we'll talk about adoption. So many, many years ago, before the internet age, life was simpler. You had a, you'd have a professor in a school. They'd select maybe a text. It would reach 30 students. And it was a confined, closed system, if you will. But the internet really changed everything. And what we're seeing is the formation of knowledge networks, a communities of learning uh, that are beginning to span the globe. And this is having a tremendous impact on many, many industries. You look at the computer industry, the open software movement, how innovation has sped up as technology uh, development has progressed. You look at the transformation in the music industry. Uh, you look at newspaper industries, how they've undergone wholesale change. But then on the left side, uh, you see the textbook industry. And that really hasn't changed that much. Yes, the publishers have incorporated some technology, but the same revision cycles exist. Uh, the, uh, the same uh, uh, higher prices exist. Uh, and it's very controlled uh, uh, distribution of content. The economics of that, though, as we've discussed earlier, have broken. And this is going to be driving and is beginning to drive some significant change in the market. Let's talk about the licenses for a second. I think the audience is pretty well versed on this. I know we've got Cable Green on, so if I make a mistake, he'll be sure to point it out to me. Uh, but uh, Creative Commons has various uh, licenses. Uh, one of the least restrictive licenses is a CC BY license. Uh, and this means that you can take the content uh, you can adapt it, you can use it as is, and you can redistribute it uh, for free to the community. As we move down the licensing schema here, uh, more restrictions are imposed. So if we look at the last one on this case, CC by NCND, uh, that means that there's no commercial use, no derivative allowed. All of the materials in OpenStax College are under a CC by license. That means you can take the resources, and you can use as little or as much of them as you want, and you can redistribute them without permission. This also allows what we call frictionless remixing in the Connections platform. The Connections platform is really the platform that runs OpenStax College. In Connections, we have over 20,000 learning objects, and they're all under a CC BY license. So just for the purpose of today's discussion, in terms of OpenStax, uh, you are free to take uh, these materials and do with them as you wish. So uh, the next point uh, we like to discuss is really how OER can enhance academic freedom. And the reason we point this out is because some op uh, opponents of OER will talk about how OER limits um, academic freedom, how it will be mandated. Well, we really want to put those notions to rest. At the course level, OER provides faculty with more choices in their courses. You, can, you now have options beyond what just traditional publishers would provide you. As we just discussed, if you have OER resources, uh, you can, you're free to edit them and adapt them and redistribute them. You don't need permission to do that. So you have more choices. And OER prevents you if you're using an adaptive online homework system or an LMS from being locked into a particular platform or system. I'm always surprised at the number of faculty who say, boy, I really like the homework system, but I don't like the book, but I'm locked. With OER now, you don't have to be locked in anymore. In the marketplace, our position, OpenStax College and Rights position, is OER should never be legislated or mandated. This needs to be made at the local level, at the faculty level. And OER needs to stand on its own vis-a-vis -vis the publisher materials. It's the faculty and the course coordinators, ultimately, who will determine what is best for that course. Another important component to consider with OER is students and digital rights management. And this is a, critic, a critically important issue in the way that the students now interact with content. 
cost is certainly, you know, uh, paramount, and we think this is too. Digital rights management, especially when you start to adopt ebooks, basically limits your rights to what you can do with the content. Most notably, it limits access. With open licenses, students have unlimited access to the materials. So if they go to openstackscollege.org and they download our physics book, access to that will never expire. A lot of uh, you know, textbooks with DRM will expire after 180 days. There is unlimited printing. You can use the information, the content across devices. That's not so with DRM. And probably the most significant aspect of an open license, it encourages, to, it encourages students to share this information and this content in their informal learning net, um, networks. We know students are on Facebook all the time. And so being able to share that content in those informal learning groups is critically important. If they do that with traditional DRM content, they're violating copyright laws. So, DR, so open really lives where students live today. So what are the high level goals of OpenStax College? We've discussed this earlier. Uh, it's to increase access to high quality open education content and frankly provide students with financial relief. There were some limitations of what we call the OER 1.0 model uh, that weren't discussion. Uh, generally speaking, if you hear objections, is that there were inconsistent quality standards. Some materials were exceptional, other materials weren't quite up to par. Uh, generally speaking, in OER, we made it very difficult for faculty to find turnkey solutions. Uh, if you went on to connections, for example, uh, and you typed in physics, you might hit uh, thousands uh, uh, pieces of content. Well, that takes a lot of work for faculty to piece together. There's a lack of cooperation uh, with for-profit providers. The for-profit providers can play an important role uh, in this market, and we need to work with them since they have do play such a role to figure out ways to improve access and to dramatically lower costs. Uh, there needs to be a sustainable reward structure for content producers. Our authors need to be rewarded for their intellectual work. Reviewers need to be paid uh, if they're putting a lot of time uh, into evaluating manuscripts. And finally, uh, and this was brought up in the last session too, learning, not free, must be the priority. You must apply analytics to the open education resources and determine what is the learning outcome taking place. Are these materials uh, helping students learn more effectively? And so that's what we wanted to do with OpenStax College, really meet these challenges. So if you go to OpenStaxCollege.org, it's very easy to find the materials. Uh, you go and you select your discipline and the textbook will be right there. Next is we impose fairly rigorous uh, development standards. We recognize that free is not enough. So our texts are authored by scholars. They're extensively peer reviewed. I think the biology text had 100 reviewers on it. They're professionally developmental edited, and they are uh, professionally illustrated. Uh, these books uh, really meet the quality thresholds. A uh, third is scope and sequence. Uh, we work very closely with the community when we're developing texts to make sure that the texts meet the scope and sequence of a typical course. And so that when you go into OpenStax College, which I'll show you in a second, if you're teaching physics or biology, you'll see that it will map up to uh, really virtually all courses. If you want to adapt it uh, to your specific course, and many people do, uh, you can do that too. We have the tools to do it. In fact, of the first six books we published, there's already 70 derivative versions. And then finally, uh, we provide essential learning resources. There are solution manuals free for students. Those now cost $100 as you go to a publisher. Uh, we have PowerPoint slides. We have test item files. And we also partner with organizations uh, in STEM markets uh, that provide online homework. So thanks to the foundation support, uh, we've been able to build this library. Uh, we'll be up to 25 textbooks when we're done. Uh, thanks to the Hewlett Foundation, the 20 Million Minds Foundation, I think one of, I think Myra is on today, 
uh, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and okay. others who have really supported the development um, of these uh, uh, books. So the titles below here, Physics, Sociology, Biology, Concepts of Biology, um, Anatomy and Physiology, uh, Statistics, Barbara Lapsky is on the call today. She's one of our authors. Uh, these are available today uh, for students to use. And economics, well, these will be coming out in about two weeks, followed by pre-calculus. Uh, I did see a question, is, does OpenStax College, do we provide courseware? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, we're not a MOOC, and uh, we don't plan on being one. Okay, so what happens when you go to the OpenStax College website? As I said, it's very simple. Uh, the student or the professor simply comes and selects the discipline that they want. Uh, there is no password required, no registration required, uh, and then they can select one of the versions that they would like. We do offer books in low-cost print, that full color, very inexpensive. The Concepts of Biology book, I think, is $28 or $29. We do offer um, iBook I versions, um, and the vast majority of our users uh, they go for either the, the PDF, which they download, uh, they can read it live on the web, uh, or we offer it uh, in uh, EPUB for mobile devices. Our goal on this is clear. Uh, access anywhere, at any time, on any device, in any format. So you select the text, uh, and then uh, you download your textbook. And this is an example of the biology text, which is 47 chapters. Uh, and this is just a this is a, a discussion of the carbon cycle, but it gives you a sense of the quality that we're going um, towards. Well, most people will tell me after they look through this, they like the author's perspective, uh, number one. Number two, they like the fact that we integrate uh, interactive um, elements. For instance, in the biology book, we have a partnership with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. But at the end of the day, they say, well, really, what is the difference? Uh, between this and a $300 textbook or $250 textbook. And I say, well, about $250. Uh, and, uh, and everyone laughs and uh, they realize there's a great opportunity. So this is terrific. Uh, we've got six textbooks now. How are we doing? Are faculty responding? Are they adopting? And overwhelmingly, we say yes, that we are inspired by faculty who are leading the charge in adopting OER. So if you look at the number on physics here, 245 adoptions, uh, 1.8 million web views, been downloaded 205,000 times, and that means doing something. Uh, you have to you have to wait for it to download. It's a huge file, and we say students with physics alone over 2.6 million dollars. And I think what's really also encouraging is that we have commu great community colleges using the book, like American River College. Austin Community College, uh, uh, Matt Bay Community College. We also have four-year state schools at Pittsburgh State and UT Austin. So we're seeing the need across the market, one, two. We also think that the books are really pitched at the right level because a lot of community colleges are, are they're concerned about matriculation. And so it gives them great comfort to see that schools in which their students will matriculate to are using OpenStax college titles. The college physics was our first title, and it really is just the beginning. If you look at our total metrics, uh, the usage is growing exponentially every six months. Savings now exceed 5.5 million, web views over 3.1 million times, the downloads 400,000. This year, we estimate the impact on students enrolled in courses. There's a lot of students who use these materials who aren't enrolled in courses, to be 58,000 plus. Uh, and so the whole network is growing. And our ecosystem partners are also growing. That used to be like one or two. We've got 14 ecosystem partners now. So let's talk about that for a second. Because we know that a great book is not enough. Uh, and that people need uh, more advanced technology. Incidentally, all the books are being meditized to be used in adaptive learning platforms. Uh, but we have partnerships with great organizations like Lumen, Google, Sapling, um, Apple, LearningPod, WebAssign, and they're providing extra services and products to go with these resources. And you can find out more about them on the website. 
some of these um, are for sale. So if you uh, if you signed up with uh, Wiley Plus uh, with biology, the price of that will be approximately fifty dollars. That's still saving the students over a hundred dollars over conventional system. And some of these ecosystem partners also provide a small mission support feedback for sustainability. So we think this is a very vibrant development, one in which the market's going to shift from the publisher controlling everything into a market that's much more distributed, highly efficient, uh, and uh, improve access for everyone. And this is what you're seeing here in this diagram, this network of connectivity around uh, OER uh, 2.0. So uh, let me uh, briefly uh, wrap up here with some FAQs. What's the catch or obligation? There is none. Uh, this is really philanthropy. The only thing we ask is if you like what we're doing, please tell a friend. We don't have a sales force. I don't like X or you don't have Y. Great. No book is perfect. Our books are not perfect. And these can be adapted uh, very, very simply. I'm happy to work with you on that. Do we have single sign-on? Uh, well, in a way we do. If you use DTOL or if you use Blackboard, there's many customers who will take the files and embed them in their courses. May I adapt and distribute without permission? Yes, you may. Do you have comp copies? Yes, we do. We don't like to give them out. We're a nonprofit. Uh, but if a comp copy is absolutely mandatory to get an adoption, we're happy to provide you one. With no sales reps, how do I get service? Very simple. Info at openstackscollege.org. If we don't reply within a day, don't use us. What about revisions? Great question. Some subjects don't warrant revision as frequently as the publishers do. Physics doesn't change that much. It will not be revised. People will not be forced into a revision. Some subjects do warrant it, like economics. There we will revise when it's, when it's pedagogically um, uh, warranted. Who do I call if I find an error? Info at openstackscollege.org. And we have, uh, uh, we have a page on the site called the Stack Stash. So we're the only publisher in the world that posts our errata. Uh, and then finally, can bookstores order physical com um, copies? Absolutely they can. We work with them every day. So in conclusion, I thank you for listening to this. I hope I didn't ramble on too long. <clears throat> Together we can build a sustainable future. And we love this quote from Gandhi. First they ignore you, and we know who they are. Then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. And where are we? I think we're somewhere probably getting towards the fighting stage. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you, David. Um, <laughs> lots of exciting uh, conversation going on in the chat window, and uh, we'll get back to some of that um, at the end here. Um, but excellent presentation. Um, and on to our last presenter who also has some really great information for us. And this is David Ernst who is the Chief Information Officer at the College of Education at the University of Minnesota. And David's going to talk to us about the Open Text Library, which is a listing site for open textbooks, high quality open textbooks I might add. And David's focus is on um, getting faculty to adopt, which uh, many of us who work with uh, faculty and administrators um, know that, that, that faculty need a lot of information before they're ready to adopt um, high quality resources. And David is going to talk to you about the strategies they're coming up with there. David? Great. Thank you, Elena. Um, before I start, I do want to tell you, I, I, I mentioned uh, in my introduction that I'm in New Orleans right now uh, at the Educause Learning Initiative Conference. And I should, I'm just bringing this up because I'm finding open textbooks are all over uh, this conference. I was a keynote this morning with Stephen Mintz. He's, the, he's at the University of Texas Systems Institute for Transformational Learning. And he uh, was basically talking about innovations that will change the face of higher education by 2015, which is uh, coming up pretty quick here. Uh, and uh, the top of his list was open textbooks. Um, and anyway, there have been a number of presentations, and it's clear that this is a, a, a movement, if you want to call it that, that's really gaining momentum. And uh, I, I agree with David. I think we're getting maybe to the fighting stage and closer to the, the, the winning stage, I think, of uh, our all yard. Um, so what I'd like to do is I want to talk about the textbook library, but in context of kind of the work that we've been doing more generally, which is, um, which is uh, answering this one question. 
And so for the last about two and a half years, this has been um, our focus. It's been uh, the question we've been asking. So my job as the CIO in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota is, is really an on-the-ground job. I am with faculty every day helping them adopt technologies, helping them, uh, supporting them and improving their courses. And so that combination of asking this question and really having access to these faculty who, who ask really good questions, who, who have real problems that they need to get through and questions and misunderstandings, uh, that's at the core of, of where we are, um, is, is solving those. So what I'd like to do, I think um, Sorrell and David gave a really great background on, on the issues, on OER, on uh, licenses, and all that. I'm not going to get into that at all because they already did and really talk about the barriers that we have discovered and tried to overcome with our faculty and other faculty that we have uh, talked with. Okay, let me think here. All right. So number one, I'm going to start on this. Is um, number one is is in some ways there's really uh, not really much of an understanding that there's even an option, right? So it's kind of an a, a, they're almost decided. Well, this is just the way things are. And so well, one thing that we do is spend a lot of time. With, we've created some faculty development um, that has worked really well here in kind of sensitizing faculty to the issues. You saw some statistics earlier about the financial situation of students. Uh, this is just in Minnesota, the funding sources that have, uh, they're funding higher education. This is a per FTE state funding in red versus tuition in, in the green. And you can see that the load is really being put on students. And so we'll give them data like that. I think you saw a graph similar to this earlier. Student loan debt is in blue. Credit card debt is in red. This is a nation, national numbers. Um, so sensitizing to the fact that students are really more than ever in a pinch. Uh, this, I believe, is from the Florida uh, uh, survey that was mentioned earlier as well, just the impact of cost of textbooks then of, of, uh, on, on basically on academic success of students, and which faculty really, really care about, of course. So after we presented that to our, to our faculty and brought that up to them, this is how many adoptions we had. Uh, zero. Uh, so, all right, what's the next barrier then? What, we knew these textbooks were out there. Why weren't faculty adopting them? So the next thing we realized that they don't really understand what open is, what open textbooks are, or um, uh, on what, just what the concept of open is. Oftentimes, it's, they confuse it with just free textbooks or electronic textbooks. Now, of course, open textbooks are free, can be free. They're, they are, they do kind of live in the electronic world, but it's not the same. Publishers create electronic books or models where books are filled with ads and free. And so anyway, it's, it's, but understanding the Creative Commons license and understanding um, what, how open is really defined. So we spend some time pointing, we've, we've kind of defined the problem for them, and now we're saying, here's a solution that we really think is uh, possible for you and your students. I hear it mm -hmm. So what we've, what we've developed is basically a faculty development program that puts together those two pieces. The urgency part is making them aware of the issues, and the open part is really explaining to them, here's a solution that's, that's possible. After that, uh, we still had zero adoptions, so there must be more barriers. Um, next, we really uh, learned pretty quickly that faculty just don't know where to find open textbooks, and so that's why we developed this open textbook library. Um, we uh, realized that there needed to needed to be pulled together in one place, so we kind of looked around the internet and 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 pulled them all in so that they are in one place that's searchable. Easy to look at. We had help from uh, many people in designing it to make it uh, easy for faculty to use. Uh, and so, and, and there's the URL of it right there. If you weren't aware of uh, where it is, it's uh, at open.umn.edu. And uh, you can, I think we're up to about a been between 140 and 150 uh, textbooks in there right now of uh, various content areas. Making people aware of this catalog, creating it, uh, we still in our 
the university had zero adoptions. So, uh, okay, what's next? What still is needed? Faculty obviously are very concerned about quality. Um, and so uh, what we did is make sure that in the catalog we actually had the opportunity for faculty to do peer reviews. Now, this is something that we've learned a lot about. We didn't, we, um, we don't have a lot of uh, reviews in there yet. In the next two years, we should pick up uh, hundreds of them, actually. And, and it's a long story of how we would get that, but uh, we're very excited that that's going to come soon. So we have some in there. Uh, most of them thanks to our friends at BC Campus. Hi, Mary. And uh, um, hopefully those will help faculty trust each other, as they should, with academic um, resources like this as far as quality goes. I'm not qualified to judge the quality, but they are. I would mention, I'd like to, an aside here, um, as I'm talking with faculty, quality is the big issue. They, kind of, they, they make the false assumption that something that's free can't be good. But I think from, you probably have seen from uh, the Sherelle's and David's presentation that the process is very similar, if not better, than what some, some um, commercial publishers go through as far as peer review goes. Um, I actually met uh, the author of the upcoming uh, uh, OpenStax uh, econ book this morning, uh, David. And he basically said how he was impressed how many, how much peer review happened. Our faculty need to know that uh, because they, again, make this assumption that free cannot mean it's been, it must just be someone wrote it through it on the internet. So I think that's that open textbook 2.0 that David is talking about. It's a different world now. Okay, so. <laughs> So all of that said, we created this catalog, peer reviews, all of that. We had no adoptions at ours, and you know, I mean, and I, I can't blame our faculty at all. They're very busy. Uh, they're being asked to do so many things, and frankly, if they didn't know what, if they didn't adopt an open textbook, the world wouldn't end for them. So, uh, what we needed was, uh, what we needed was an engagement strategy. And we needed uh, we needed to just get them to stop the merry-go-round that they are on in academia. I mean, they are constantly busy in research and outreach and their teaching and and all of that. They're very very busy people. To just get them to stop, and that's when we asked them to actually review an open textbook. To just and and we and we actually incentivized it with a very small amount of money, but just enough to get their attention. And when we think about the money invested in this, say. One to two hundred dollars to write a very short, concise review that we can use in the catalog uh, that would be useful to somebody else. Uh, and, and then you think about the savings. A one to two hundred dollar investment is nothing. That's one textbook. Uh, and if they actually end up adopting an open textbook because they did take this time to review it, um, again, the savings are instant. So. So in our college, in the, in the small, I was only working with a small group of faculty. Um, we had seven. We had excuse me, nine faculty review textbooks. Seven of them ended up adopting. So we did through the professional development to explain uh, again the issues and what open is. We did all of these things, and it's kind of like the, the the capstone event that we really needed was this uh, was this adopt was this engagement strategy of just reviewing. This, we had nine faculty review, seven adopted of those nine. And then they also went back to their uh, departments and convinced three others, three others of their, of their colleagues to adopt. So we ended up with 10 faculty adopting. I don't have final numbers right now, but it's somewhere around $200,000 since the fall of 2012 that they've saved students. And as, as people working in the open textbook world know that it, it adds up very fast. So, um, what's next? Um, what we're trying to do is, I mean, as what we, we learned within one context of our own institution, and as we are reaching out now to other institutions to help them, um, we got a Hewlett Foundation grant um, uh, within the last couple months to actually go to other institutions and help them create an open textbook initiative. So we're looking for institutions actually where the leadership is ready. 
they just don't quite know what to do, and they could really benefit from us and the, the kind of hard learning that we did that we had to do in the, in the last two years. Um, but we already know that as we reach out and go to other institutions, there will be other barriers. Um, for instance, uh, we hear quite quite regularly, and I know David, I think, has has heard this. Um, that oh, what's going to happen? Our bookstore is actually produce revenue for our institution. What's going to happen to that revenue? And those kinds of questions that we need to be able to answer. Those are legitimate questions, and we need to be able to have some sort of a uh, a path forward for institutions uh, and help them answer those. Uh, the answer to that one that I give, by the way, and if anyone has a better one, uh, feel free to add, give it. But uh, the answer to that one is that institutions simply, I'd say, that have to have a common internal conversation about their priorities. If selling books is a priority for them and making a profit off of that, more than the uh, anyway, I guess you can tell what my opinion is on that. Um, and so um, we will continue to learn, and hopefully everyone will continue to benefit from uh, from what we learn as we kind of reach out and uh, help other institutions. So. Again, there's the URL for our catalog. Um, feel free to use it or send it around. Anyone who wants to use it, we're, we just crossed, I think, the 100,000 uh, user mark uh, just this last week, and uh, it's being used by uh, over, uh, by I think, 188 countries around the world. So, uh, so you're welcome to it. That's why it's there. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, David, for sharing um, all those different strategies for encouraging um, adoption of open textbooks by faculty. Um, they, um, having, <laughs> having worked in this field, uh, uh, they all sound excellent for quite a while, um, and I, I could see a lot of chat uh, about um, engagement, faculty engagement. So thank you for that. Um, we are going to move to questions, although we have a um, because we had such wonderful presentations um, and our presenters really had such great information. We are almost up on the hour. I want to tell you that our next set of webinars will be occurring in March, and we will do those in alignment with Open Education Week, which is March 10th through 15th. Um, and it. Open Education Week is all about promoting open education globally um, to enhance teaching and learning. So sounds familiar. Um, and on Tuesday, March 11th, we will have an OER and Accessibility Day, which, will, um, which um, the Community College Consortium is participating in. And then Wednesday, uh, March 12th, will be the Community College OER Day. So stay tuned for announcements on those. And if you um, would like to participate in any of those presentations, please contact me. We'd love to have your participation. All right. At this time, we, um, we're just on the hour. I think we're going to try and keep the uh, phone and uh, the, the conference going for another five minutes uh, for questions. And we've had some excellent questions over the last hour that have come up, which I think uh, possibly we might want to um, just recap a few things um, and go ahead and type in if people have additional new questions, do go ahead and we'll try and get to those. If not, there is the contact information for Cyril, David, and, and David, um, and myself, and please do contact us over email after the fact. And, I, and once again, I want to thank our uh, wonderful presenters today. Um, that, they were amazing. Um, so one topic that came up was um, what is the difference between free and open? And um, I know that uh, David Ernst uh, addressed this, and um, I know we happen to have Cable Green online. Cable, would you like to address that? Are you are you on mic? Um, a quick uh, uh, sure, no, I can hear you. Uh, one minute elevator speech on. Yep, can hear you great. Well, at its most basic level, uh, free means no cost, meaning you can get access to something without paying money to get access to it, and that's, that's great. And certainly OER is free, and so is a Coursera course uh, on, on their MOOC, uh, and that's great too. Uh, open has an additional requirement to it, and open is something must be free and, so the and is critical, and you must have the legal rights to exercise what we call the four R's. So you must have the legal rights to reuse the resource, revise it, uh, remix it, and redistribute. 
So if you don't have the legal rights to do those four things, uh, it's not it's not open. So you know, take the take an OpenStax textbook as an example. Is it free to users? Yes, it is. So it meets the first criteria. Uh, can I legally revise, reuse, remix, and redistribute that book? Yes, I can. Uh, so it meets both criteria. Therefore, it's an it's an OER. Uh, take a Coursera course as another example. Some of the courses are openly licensed, most are not. But let's pretend that we're looking at one that's an all rights reserved course. Is it free? Yes. Uh, is it? Do you have the legal rights to uh, revise it, reuse it, remix, and redistribute? No, you don't. It's all rights reserved, copyright. And if you do those things, uh, you will be uh, violating U.S. copyright law, and you could be sued. And so we call that not open, uh, but although it is free. All right. Th thank you for that, Cable. Um, really good distinctions there. Mm -hmm. We had a question about open test banks uh, from Patty, and um, it, because this is really a critical piece of um, textbook uh, content today, and I wonder, um, David Harris in particular, can you talk about test banks and open yeah, stats so and what you're doing about things. that? And I actually have a question to that question. Uh, we have an open uh, a ba a test bank of questions uh, that, that expands beyond just OpenStack called QuadBase. Um, those are all openly licensed. And then we do have uh, test banks, test items uh, for uh, uh, most of our titles, not all. Uh, we're working on them. We know it's important. Uh, 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 Barbara Lowski's text actually will have a, um, a comprehensive test bank. Uh, that was actually developed um, University of Minnesota. Uh, I've got one question for you. Of course, when we come to tax items, we're concerned about um, uh, you know the, 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 that they don't get into the wrong hands, that they don't fall into students' hands, so to speak. How can you prevent that if they're openly licensed? Um, an, an excellent question in and of itself, um, and <laughs> perhaps we'll, uh, we'll 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 leave that one for uh, for another time because I think that that's a longer one. Uh, but thank you, oh, Barbara has a, Barbara has a great explanation here. Let's see regarding test banks. Some folks worry about students getting in. So she doesn't worry about it. If a student wants to practice on two thousand plus questions, okay, good then point. Fine, excellent. <laughs> that, that, is, that, that is one great answer, and I think there's a lot of different points on that one. I, I, before we run out of time, um, let's see. I, there was questions about licensing, and uh, particularly, Cyril, these were directed at you, and um, you shared in the in the chat window that your faculty decide on the license of the textbook that they produce. Do you want to? Could you elaborate just a little on that? Sure. Um, actually, it, it's more of a um, we, we've got a CCBY NCSA license that we we distribute our open textbooks on. That's that's what the authors do. Now, the author retains the copyright so that they can put it on print on demand and they make all royalties off of it. Um, that's the model that we decided for pilot one and two. Um, it's, it makes the most sense um, in many ways for the faculty to have an incentive to, in addition to what we're offering, to produce their work in print as well. But um, so it's open. It's it's got a um, share-alike license and a non-commercial license because that is a concern of many faculty who author works is they don't want other people to monetize their work. So um, we put that in as the agreement if they want to publish with us, um, and it's a good it's a good license because others can make derivatives so long as they give attribution to the work, and that's that's really key. They just others can't commercialize it. All right. Good Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Cyril. It's a, that's a really interesting approach. Uh, but the, as you say, the faculty author retains the copyright, so they can release it in any manner they would like, in addition to. Exactly. Wonderful. All right. Um, 
I think at this point we're probably going to close out the session. Um, David Ernst, I didn't give you a chance to recap. But would you like um, a final statement before we close off here? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we're in good shape. I, I, I would offer actually since it is part of our grant that if our institutions that are looking for uh, some help in that where we think the, think the leadership may be ready to, to do something, um, be happy to have a conversation. Wonderful. And, and David's uh, email is there um, yeah. in, the, uh, in, in our um, main window here. So I want to thank once again all of you who joined us today for this very informative web webinar. And I do want to thank our uh, presenters. Um, you guys were amazing. So okay. thanks everyone and see you in March. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.